Some of the quietest cyber attacks are the most deadly. Trojan malware, named after an ancient story of subterfuge, is designed to get inside target networks, and help attackers steal data, conduct espionage and more. This is ZDNet Security Update. I'm Danny Palmer and with me to talk about the threat posed by Trojan malware is Levu Arsen, Global Cybersecurity Researcher at Bitdefender. Thanks for joining me, Levu. So, what is Trojan malware and how exactly does it work? Hi, Danny. Um, well, basically, Trojan malware is just as the name implies. It's basically a piece of malware that pretends to be something else in order you know, to trick the victim into installing it. So it's basically like uh, the old story that you mentioned from ancient Greece, you know, the Trojan horse. It pretended to be like a gesture of peace, but then armies were inside the, uh, the Trojan horse. And once the, Trots got, the Trojan horse got inside the inside the city, the citadel, basically everybody could came, come out of the, uh, the horse and pretty much do whatever they wanted to do within the city. Uh, pretty much effectively denying in, uh, all the protection, the entire walls, the entire military that was you know, pretty much safe, trying to safeguard the city in any way. Um, so pretty much Trojans act in the same way these days. Uh, they usually infect victims either via um, uh, spear phishing emails it's usually an attachment that an attachment that's usually tainted with this sort of uh, sort of malware, and as soon as it reaches a uh, victim's computer, it starts doing all sorts of uh, weird things. Uh, but the interesting thing about Trojans is that they are highly um, they're very good at what they do. I mean, they're very focused. They're very specialized. You don't see a lot of Trojans anymore. You just see a couple of Trojan families that are very very good at what they do. For example. Uh, if you remember, um, there's been Emotet. It's been going around for a while. It's basically a uh, spam sending piece of uh, Trojan, piece of malware. So basically, as soon as it infects a victim, it starts using their own uh, inbox to send emails to you know, contacts and stuff like that. We've seen um, TrickBot. There's another good example. Uh, what makes it interesting is that it's highly modular. Of course, it has some core functionalities that it needs to have in order to, to use. Uh, but it also supports different types of modules, you know, just like a, like a developer uh, would need in order to improve the functionality of that specific Trojan. And um, it, usually you don't see, for example, a single piece of Trojan when uh, um, it reaches a victim. You usually end up seeing more than one. For example, you can see, and we have seen, Emotet and TrickBot working together or being delivered together uh, on the same computer. It's like a combo, basically. One is very good at doing something, the other one prevents augments the other one's features. So uh, let's take a particular example. You've, we have seen Emotet, TrickBot, and Ryuk, which is basically a, a piece of ransomware, all working together. So the combo itself working together. Uh, Emotet was very good at um, using the victim's email address to, to send spam infected spam to uh, the victim's uh, entire contact list. Uh, then there was Emotet, then there was uh, TrickBot that was very good at uh, doing lateral movement. It, you know, it has the ability to exploit various unpatched vulnerabilities for various services and applications that run at the network layer. And then TrickBot is also very good at identifying whether or not the infrastructure, the compromised infrastructure belongs to an end user, you know, like, a, like a regular home, or it belongs to an infrastructure um, by, owned by a company, by an organization. And based on that, basically, it knew how to deliver the re, uh, Ryuk ransomware and adjust the payload as well. Because if, you're, if you are a very large organization with a very large number of endpoints and you have uh, information that, if lost, would otherwise compromise your business, then that means you are more willing to pay a ransom note you know, that's a bit higher than, uh, than average. So basically, you have this combo of two Trojans and a piece of ransomware all being used for um, various purposes. So with uh, these advanced attacks, how is it that, that those behind them are, are able to build a Trojan malware so it, it doesn't stay detected on these networks? Because as, as you've described, it seems it, it gets its claws into almost everything, but without being picked up uh, by the security team uh, running that network. It's, very, it's, very, it's a very good question because uh, right now malware operates under a as a service you know, MO. Basically, malware developers are offering uh, various types of Trojans that they constantly build upon and improve you know, in order to make sure that they dodge security features or they add new functionalities. And they offer these pieces of malware Trojans to the highest bidder. So basically, if you are 
uh, trying to launch your own campaign, a spear phishing campaign, or you want to make money, you basically contact through the dark web or various obscure forums, these malware developers that offer you the Trojan as a service. It basically means they will even offer you support. They will make sure that um, the, the features that they provided for their Trojans are 100% reliable, and they will sometimes even guarantee that they can get through specific uh, security solutions, although you know remain undetected for a very short time, but they will guarantee and work with you 24 seven to make sure that they can dodge security solutions for a specific amount of time. So we're looking at um, uh, a business model, basically. Trojans, you know, they're not like we're uh, used to hearing uh, in the past, you know, like we've known in the past. You see a Trojan, you see a detection, and then that's it, that piece of malware is gone forever. No, it's basically um, a self-improving, constantly adapting, uh, always um, uh, trying to offer the best experience, if you're a customer experience, for their clients. So it's malware as a service. Um, and we, what's interesting is that, for example, we've seen a couple of um, uh, campaigns in which um, these guys usually try to um, uh, deliver through these well-known uh, infrastructures that are basically parked, if you will, by uh, Emotet or TrickBot. They try to, live, to deliver specific threats to specific targets. Uh, I believe um, uh, at some point, I believe in earlier this year, we found a new module for TrickBot. Uh, what was interesting about that was that um, it was a remote desktop protocol brute forcing module. Uh, but that, that's not the interesting part. TrickBot already had a couple of modules that did exactly that and more. What was interesting is that this particular mod, uh, module um, had the ability to do brute forcing on a very specific list of IP addresses. IP addresses that uh, belong to targets in the US and Hong Kong. Now, to you know, the average user, that might not exactly you know, spell something fishy, but when you have um, a piece of Trojan or a Trojan, a piece of malware that's usually designed to um, infect victims with a shotgun shell approach, if you will, you know, try to infect as many victims as possible. When you see a module like this that's, that's specifically built to target a very limited number of uh, victims, you start asking yourself a, a couple of questions, you know, uh, like, um, could this be some sort of um, really targeted attack? Could some group of individual highly skilled skilled individual be leveraging an existing infrastructure that's being run by TrickBot to deliver their own attack. You know, you all, it's like you already have uh, the means to deliver the attack to your targets and you simply just hide um, uh, your own intentions within that pool of victims and try to make sure you cover your tracks very, very well. And this could actually be indicative of uh, some sort of new pattern that we could be seeing uh, throughout the year. You know, cyber, uh, cyber attacks try to, trying to leverage existing infrastructure to carry out more targeted, more pinpoint accurate um, attacks on victims. You raised an interesting case there. I mean, you mentioned how Trojan malware was quite different uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and how it's evolved into what it is now. I mean, it's almost having a bit of a resurgence in a way, despite having, I guess, as it intended to, go under the radar for a few years uh, prior to this. Exactly. So uh, if you, you can look at Trojans these days. I mean, there are a couple of really popular uh, Trojan families, and you can look at them as, um, if you will, the first stage of an attack. You know, if you're planning um, uh, a really sophisticated attack and you don't want to pretty much reveal some of your tools or the, your end game, you're basically going to be using off-the-shelf tools to get you a little bit more information about your target. And it makes sense that at some point we, we can assume that some cyber criminal groups may leverage Trojans. You know, they're pretty common. They're pretty easy to uh, get your hands on. They're pretty accessible. They already have an infrastructure. So it makes sense to do a little bit of um, uh, an exercise of imagination and try to conceive of a scenario in which APT groups could leverage Trojans to do a little bit of forensic work or to do a little bit of uh, information harvesting from their targets. Because if they manage, I mean, one of the, mo one of the uh, purposes, one of the basic features of all of these Trojans is information harvesting, usernames, passwords, uh, information about the infrastructure, information about the, the systems that they've compromised and so on. So if you get, gain all that information without revealing your true, in, uh, true intent or revealing um, uh, the ace in your, in your sleeves basically means that you can have, you can increase the chances for success and use that information on a separate attack vector. 
And that's why there are industries like oil and gas, uh, like higher education, where Trojan malware attacks are being detected against them because they have such useful information, which if, it, if it's stolen, can be used and exploited by cyber criminals, hostile nation states, and a whole variety of other, 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 other players. Exactly. So um, it's interesting that you brought up oil and gas because um, as the recent um, oil crisis, you know, the, the shortage and everything, the oil price literally tumbling down, um, just um, a few days afterwards, uh, we've seen a couple of uh, spear phishing campaigns delivering the um, uh, agent Tesla Trojan. And this is basically a piece of Trojan that's uh, designed to collect uh, credentials, uh, you know, the usernames and passwords for various services, or even collect everything that you type on your keyboard, like the traditional key logging uh, piece of malware, piece of Trojan. Um, now, what was interesting about this uh, specific campaign is that it impersonated a reputable and well-known, well-established um, oil and gas company from Egypt, and the emails were directly uh, going after other companies that you know work in oil and gas from different countries and although the number of emails that were being sent was not you know a large number of emails like you would see with traditional spear phishing campaigns you know hundreds of thousands or stuff like that there were, there were actually a couple of hundred emails they were very well crafted very well designed even the language the jargon that was being used to convince the recipient that it's a legitimate email was very well written so that means somebody, whoever designed those emails, had some sort of vested interest in compromising uh, their targets without giving away too much of their intent. You know, they're basically trying to uh, make sure that um, uh, they increase the chances of success, you know, to, for the victim to actually execute the attachment while at the same time collect as much information about and from the victim without revealing their end game, without revealing the motivation behind their attack. And of course, all of this information could potentially be used uh, later on in various, uh, in various attack vectors. For example, imagine you would have the ability to collect usernames and passwords from uh, an email account you know, that belongs to one of these uh, organizations, to an employee that works in oil and gas. Then you would have access potentially to more than just that person's emails and confidential information, but you would also be able to map the internal infrastructure. If they have an active directory, then you'd be able to see the entire infrastructure within the company, who's running what. Everything, you know, we don't give Trojans enough credit for what they can do and the damages they can cause, especially uh, they're being used by the right people with the right motivation. So with the amount of damage that they can cause, uh, what should organizations be doing to protect themselves from falling victim to Trojan malware attacks? Dealing with a Trojan infection or dealing with Trojan malware is pretty much the same as dealing with any other, uh, any other threat. It involves you know, uh, securing your endpoint uh, endpoints. Uh, it involves securing your network. It involves training your employees so they know, for example, how to spot a spear phishing email or a suspicious uh, attachment or a suspicious URL. It involves uh, having the ability to um, map out all the devices that are connected to your infrastructure, you know, making sure that you know exactly which devices at which time are connected to your infrastructure and so that you can uh, secure them properly. And basically it involves, you know, deploying an entire uh, stack of technologies that cover all the bases, everything from the, net, uh, from the network up to the endpoint. And of course, at the end, it's also about the employee. I mean, it's really important to make sure that you have sufficient and, um, let's not, and uh, very well-established policies within the organization that uh, allow employees to know what are the procedures for reporting a spear phishing email, a suspicious attack or a suspicious event, and also train them into figuring out if they are being targeted or if they are being a victim of a uh, specific type of attack. We're not talking about just emails here. We're talking about even uh, attacks that uh, involve um, uh, vishing, you know, you know, spear phishing over, over the phone. You know, try to make sure that employees know uh, the value of the information that they hold and that they know that um, that information does not need to be disclosed outside, uh, outside the company or through untrusted channels, basically. Thanks, Levi. That's some really good advice. And thank you for coming on the show. And for more on the latest cybersecurity news and advice on how to stay safe online, uh, be sure to keep reading ZDNet. Thank you for watching.